Okay, I'm going to do the setup before I go to work because i got to get the video up. Because we're running behind. It's a crazy time of year in the bud, um, home. Uh, November, December, or cray cray words. But we're enjoying it. So, this one, are you ready for the last shout out of November? We got new things coming in 2023. Hope you'll be there to see what we do. Here we go. Shout out time. Here's a shout out just for you. You support me, so I support you. This shout out is for our friend, Hey Cherry Hey, who I believe just re got into us. I haven't seen her in a while, or maybe she's new. I'm not sure. Cherry's a common name. I know I've seen a couple with that name. So, either way, we're glad to have you, and we appreciate you watching videos and commenting. Uh, she's been on our last couple uh, live, well, last arrive and a couple of premieres. And so, I'm going to thank her by uh, telling you a little bit about her channel. It says, um, come journey with me through life, natural hair, beauty, story time, travel vlogs, and more. That's pretty much a lot. I don't do hair, as you can tell. But you see, is what you get with me. I don't try. If you don't like it, you don't like it. Oh, well. Life will go on. Um, but that does not mean that there's anything wrong with taking care of yourself and... You know, wanting to look good. Um, angels <laughs> teaching me self-care. We'll get there, maybe. We'll see. Anyway, check Cherry out. Let her know that we sent you by. Like, share, comment, and have a good day. All right, Freddy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> tell me what you want to tell me. All right, this is Joe, the, the bearded historian from the Bud Files. We're going to talk a little bit about settlements today. Uh, South Dakota, as you know, came into the Union in uh, 1889. And uh, the interesting part about it is that when it was first just a territory, you know, they they took the the Louisiana Purchase, they slowly div divided it up into states, first territories, and then they would divide it further as needed. Um, South Dakota, of course, at one time was both South and North Dakota. Uh, eventually, they got the idea to split it in half because they really couldn't make up their mind on where they would put the state capital makes sense. But interestingly enough, if you go back to its original territory state, um, you would almost consider its highway to be the Missouri River. Because a lot of times they would send steamships up the river with supplies. Um, if they found a good place that they could, you know, put anchor down and move stuff onto the shore and start uh, settlements... The, the area over there was really good for growing crops and stuff. Uh, they had a lot of places like Vermilion, which is a, a pretty good town, uh, college town right now. Uh, you got, you know, some of the places like Yankton. And then, of course, up by uh, Springfield, Bonhomme, and even Greenwood. But the primary thing is, is that, you know, at the very first, give two, three decades. That was the big thing that helped South Dakota start to grow was that, you know, they had a way in outside of, you know, using your feet or, you know, having a land rush, which eventually would happen in some places. Um, a lot of people will look at South Dakota and they'll go to the south eastern corner. You know, it, it's very meticulous, very well laid out. There's a lot of farmers that came into the area. Um, the big thing that a lot of people also realize is that the East River, you know, it had a lot of its bloom way before they even got to the other side of the river, which is understandable. Um, also, a lot of the towns would start to grow around the locations of the railroads. Uh, Mitchell uh, became a hub for the Milwaukee line. Uh, the Northwestern came up through Parker. Uh, you also had the St. Paul, which, you know, came up through Canton. And, of course, Sioux Falls had, you know, <laughs> railroads going in about seven different directions. Uh, it was a major hub for the Midwest. Uh, a lot of stuff took and sprouted coming over from Montana, well, <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> and as the town on that side grew, you know, places like Watertown saw a lot of population, Millbank 
still in existence, even though it's a small town, uh, the town of Brookings, uh, another college town. And you also had some places, interestingly enough, that bloomed because of the trains, but also died because of the trains. A lot of places were promised that, oh, we'll have the train come through here. Well, the train would come through, and then as the train moved on, the jobs and the people went with it. You know, a lot of places can say, oh, yeah, well, we need a train because we've got farmers. Well, yeah, so does everybody else in eastern South Dakota. So you had to find a second or third source for people to take and bring, you know, a railroad and keep that railroad going. Um, they need a reason to stay. Yeah, because, I mean, just as much as everybody likes having a town called Stockholm, it's not going to be your number one thing to keep the place going. Uh, there's a lot of places in eastern South Dakota. We, we could have a, 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 a Jeopardy game. Is this or not a town in eastern South Dakota? Vienna. Only um, people who are like you would know the answer to their question. Exactly. Or is that or they're cheating and they're looking it up as we're talking? Google's not allowed. <laughs> uh, and yes, we actually do have a Dallas out here too. Um, but as we said, is that, you know, at one time there was over 35 different sets of railroads going into eastern South Dakota. But by 1950, I think the number was down to four. It, it shrank that bad. But a lot of places, uh, you know, Huron still has a, a decent population. Redfield still has a decent population. Aberdeen. And what some of these places did was that they started uh, taking benefit of the fact that some of these places, uh, you know, they have really good hunting, uh, different types of crops. Some people did both farming and ranching. Uh, with that much wide open land, there was a lot of things people could do. Uh, and there was also a lot of counties. Interestingly enough, there are some counties that are just like the West River. They don't have a lot of people. But then again, some of them are also kind of tiny. Uh, there's <laughs> unique counties like Hand, uh, Beetle, Sanborn, and Davison. They're, they're smaller counties. They have a, a really hardy population. They do get some pretty, you know, heavy weather, isn't snow, uh, depending on where you're at in the county. I have read where we've seen places completely uh, shut down because of snow. And even today, uh, if it gets bad enough, they will shut down the I-90 interstate, which is our primary artery cutting straight through the state. Uh, if it usually gets bad enough that they shut down I-90, you can usually bank on it uh, lasting anywhere from two to three days while they try to get plows going again. They usually see the semis uh, banned from being able to drive on I-90, and then all the truck stops along I-90 are full of semis parked. Um, Armour is the uh, one of the big towns in Douglas County. Charles Mix, which is actually right on the Missouri River, uh, saw a lot of some of its towns both bloom with the idea that you know the, town, the state was going to be huge, uh, then as soon as the railroads stopped going through some of the towns, the towns died. Uh, there was a town called Academy. It's now a ghost town. Uh, there was a town called Jasper. Pretty much a ghost town now. Hepner, same deal. Um, White Swan, same issue. Now, some of these counties, uh, it wasn't as much as the fact that the, the state didn't grow, is that they also divided up some of the land between tribes. Uh over on the east side of the Missouri River, uh, the Crow Creek uh, had a reservation that was already established, and they maintained their land to this day. You know, it's it's part of their property. Uh, further down, uh, there were par there was parts of Charles Mix that belonged to the Yankton Sioux, and uh, it's now just part of the Charles Mix County. Uh, there was also another one that was up by Watertown, and uh, that was the Lake Traverse. Indian Reservation, and it's recognized as a uh, standing reservation now. But as the counties would go along, you know, they, they were nicely divided up, you know, everything was sent out to a, the uh, map makers would go through and they'd look at the square footage, and they would draw lines out to make sure everybody got their property and everything squared away. Now, there are some places that, you know, where the railroads took and kind of went light, uh, those towns like Lebanon, uh, Lebanon's still there, 
but just not as nearly populated. Hoven is kind of an interesting case because I've actually been to the town. They have an absolutely huge church. The only thing is, I think you could fit the entire town inside the church. It's that small. But, you know, in its, in its heyday, originally they were planning on probably running the railroad up through there and then maybe connect it up to Selby or Bodle. But, as it is, they uh, are pretty much just a wide open. Uh, Springs was a, a name of a town that is now no longer there. Uh, there are places like Lebeau and uh, a town of Everts and Grass. Interestingly enough, those three pretty much uh, are now underwater because when the 1950s came around, a couple of engineers had a, a brilliant idea that they were going to dam up the Missouri River for power. Well, as uh, it were, the, somebody forgot to do the estimates just right, and, uh, well, I think a total of seven towns and quite a few square miles of land wound up uh, being underwater, and it actually caused some bad uh, feelings among the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation because they wound up having to move their capital. But anyway... Our next part of the state that makes it kind of a, an interesting deal with settlements is over in the Black Hills. Now, setting up a settlement in the Black Hills is a little trickier than actually setting up a township. Now, when you think of the Black Hills, obviously, what's the number one thing we're going after? Gold, and a lot of it. Well, there were two ways that people would go for gold in the Black Hills. The first way was known as place mining. This is when you take your pan, you'd go out and find a good creek that uh, shows some, pro some promise. Uh, people would take some of the gravel and rock, swish it around with a little bit of water, and they'd look for gold flakes. Some places were more prosperous than others. Uh, places up like Deadwood, places down by like Custer. Uh, some of the back water in uh, the Spring Creek showed some promise. And, of course, when the rumor of gold uh, was found to be positive in 1874, thanks to Custer, everybody wanted to come and make it rich quick. I mean, you really can't blame people, you know. Uh, the country was going through kind of a, uh, an, what was called a panic at the time. And so a lot of the people that, you know, didn't make out that well in the Montana gold rushes came here. And, you know, some people, it all depended on how hardy a person was. Uh, it might, you know, keep them busy for, you know, two to three days, some people two to three weeks. Well, as a person would wait, you know, they might try another location. They might try three or four locations. Well, you have what were called mining claims, and eventually those led to mining camps. Now, some of your mining camps were better organized than others. Uh, some of the places in the northern hills that, you know, would become famous. You got Lee, you got Deadwood, you had, you know, Galena, you had Terry, you had places like Pluma, uh, Carbonate, uh, Maurice was up there, Elmore. And what would happen is, is that usually the way a camp would work is the camp would have five or six key businesses within the town. You would have an assayer's office that would be able to tell you, you know, how much gold you had, what its going value was. And then if you wanted to trade it for, you know, company script, you could use the company store to buy, you know, an extra couple blankets maybe an extra pick, a couple extra pans, and some food. Now, you also had your towns, your mining camps, that would have uh, a saloon, because, well, after celebrating, you got to go get drunk, or you got drunk and then you celebrated, depending on how good your mining is. Uh, you'd have places that would sell uh, other goods like flour, uh, some meat, maybe some salt pork, uh, some would also sell ammunition, so if you wanted to protect your claim, you know, there was a lot of claim robbing back then, too. Some of these camps weren't exactly well known for, you know, honest efforts. Um, I mean, even some of the stories that came out of Deadwood when we were watching some of the videos, <laughs> you 
you learn a lot of interesting things about uh, either you made a good business deal or you knew somebody who knew how to take out a problem. But as things would go on, once, once panning started to slow down, um, the second phase of mining would kick in, and a lot of that involved going underground. Uh, a lot of places would start mining going straight through, you know, granite, uh, digging out tunnels, uh, working with uh, shafts. Uh, of course, the most famous one is the home stake. But up in the Black Hills, there was no shortage of large-scale mines. Um, a couple of the other buildings that you would see uh, pictures of as time would go along is you would see stamp mills. Uh, stamp mills are a huge construct that would be used basically to break up the rock to get to the gold inside. Uh, it was a process of working with the ore. Uh, then you also had uh, cases where they would use cyanide to try to flush the uh, gold ore out of the stones. Uh, and then, you know, other parts of the town that you would run into, uh, everybody needed housing, unless you wanted to run strictly a tent city. Some places were like that. Uh, even towards the end of the, the first phase, places like, uh, well, Tinton was a good example, they would have tar paper shacks, and they would uh, have quite a number of them so that the miners would have a place to stay. But as a, a town would grow, uh, some of them would even have, you know, besides the general store, they'd have a church, because some people had faith even then. Um, you would have the, like how you said even then, as if that... Was I'm a period... going to pray for some gold, Lord, please help me. I'm sure that there were people who did that. <laughs> exactly. But I meant, I, I mean, make it something like that. Some period in time, there was no religion it, some player. Yeah. The, 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 the crazy thing that I remember reading one time was, and I want to say it was either Dewey or it was Burdock, but they literally had more churches than saloons. That's my kind of my point is that, I mean, there are people who do not believe, but it's very hard to go someplace where they don't believe in something. Exactly. Of some sort. Yeah. But, you know, once they started getting into the mining, the only issue that people would run into there, and we read about this a couple times in, like, Keystone, is that for a time there, you know, gold was really coming out well at Keystone and Edda. But then, the mines over by Hill City, you started having tin become a big uh, prospecting claim. And so all of a sudden, all these miners who were looking to get a, a guaranteed wage flocked over to Hill City, leaving some of the mines over by Keystone going, uh, wait a second, uh, guys, uh, can we get some workers over here, please? Somebody? Uh, you know? And so a lot of places... It, became a labor issue. Uh, they also had uh, issues depending on, you know, what was a good mining material that they could get out of the ground. Um, up by Galena, silver was the big strike. Uh, of course, one of the problems that they had with Galena was a problem that you see in about three or four other places was a question of legal issue. Because some people would say, well, you know, this guy got this because he drilled into my claim. And then you all of a sudden you'd have lawyers arguing about, you know, who was right, who was wrong. Uh, if I remember, I had a couple places up by Nemo. Uh, there was one guy who was actually accused of salting the ground to try to get uh, investors to come into the neighborhood. That was the Greenwood mine, just north of Nemo. Uh, needless to say, salty is an effort to throw uh, small bits of ore over the soil to try to make it look like it's a plentiful mine, when in actuality it's uh, bone dry and there's nothing to mine there. But, in, you know, the fun thing about the Black Hills is, you know, gold was well working into the, you know, 21st century. They finally shut it down when the... Uh, price of gold dropped far enough that they wouldn't have been able to do it as a profit and so they closed up the mine and it's now a uh, research facility where they're studying dark matter and neutrinos however the uh, fact that there is still people looking for mines uh, for things like Spudamine 
and uh, uranium, other elements in the Black Hills. Mining is one of those things that it, it's always going to be around. I mean, granted, there's people that don't like mining because of how the ground's been, you know, ripped apart before. But at the same time, you know, they have made improvements. There's a lot more laws on the books. A lot more things have to be, you know, worked on before they'll just stamp and say, okay, you can go work on this. Which is why we're constantly looking at the idea of mining in places like Rochford, uh, up by Spearfish, and a couple other locations like Tintin, because uh, there's things like Talantium out there. You're, you can find it in one of two places. One of them is in Russia. The other one, right here in the Black Hills. But on to the third phase, and this is where it, it becomes kind of both a thing of geography and also a little bit of luck. Now, when they originally started making settlements in South Dakota, again, we go back to the rivers. You know, along the <clears throat> Missouri River, you would have forts that would get established. Um, obviously, Fort Pier was a big one. It was also a trading post. Um, there was the Fort Abraham Lincoln up in North Dakota. It would prove to become pivotal by Bismarck. Um, there were a couple others like Fort Sully. And then there was, uh, over by the Black Hills, Fort Meade was founded. Well, as these forts and trails and these rivers, you know, became more of an artery to these lands between the, the Black Hills and the Missouri River, you know, there were different types of settlements that would come about. Some got their start just as, you know, simple stage stops. You know, a place for, you know, people to stop, get a bite to eat, maybe rest after, you know, a day's worth of a ride in the back of a bouncing stagecoach. For those of us with spinal issues, we know all about the fun of shocks. Yeah. These things didn't have much. But, when Custer's discovery made the, made the news wire, the Congress for the Dakota area <coughs> set up and established three major arteries to the Black Hills, both for supplies and to help miners get to Deadwood. Um, there was the one from Bismarck. And it basically went in a due line from Bismarck to Deadwood, crossing every single stream on the way through. Uh, there was the one from Fort Pier to Deadwood. That one is a little more familiar, and uh, you could almost draw a line off of the old highway system because it's within maybe 10 to 15 miles from where the, the, the old highway used to be. And you can still drive that old highway. Uh, it goes all the way from Fort Pier over to Wall, over to Rapid, and then up to Deadwood. The third one was kind of an interesting one because originally it was supposed to start down in Nebraska at Valentine to work its way up, but a shorter route that they discovered would come out of Chamberlain and make a, uh, a short route over and across <coughs> and then connect up with the Cheyenne River and then make its way down to Rapid and then up to Deadwood. Well, a lot. one thing to, to realize is that this was way before anybody even came up with the idea of roads. Okay? These were trails that... The you know roads Mar existed before that, right? Huh? You know roads existed before South Dakota, right? Not in western South Dakota. I'm just saying. I know. You said that you make it sound like they invented roads in South Dakota. That's not how that works. No, these were the original trails. And from those three trails, a lot of stuff grew. Now, one of the big things, again, we look at eastern South Dakota, they had railroads. Western South Dakota didn't have any railroads to grow off of. And until they actually made the first crossing at Fort Pier and extended the railroad over to Pier, there wasn't a lot of transport of supplies and goods. However, those trails started having places where people would develop towns. 
Now, everybody knows about the, the, the great sooner runs that would happen when people went in to settle in places down in, like, Kansas and Oklahoma. Sure, let's pretend like that's a thing. Right. Somebody's going to go out there and he's just going flipping through a book. What are you talking about, the suitors? Don't use books except for you, right? I know. Everybody else doesn't do anything like that. But anyway, in 1907, <laughs> a lot of western South Dakota got open to homesteaders. Now, before that, if you <coughs> came out and you settled on a land... You could possibly get away with it with the government. They'd say, well, okay, you have this ranch out here. Let's use the Exo Ranch as an example because it was up by Bixby. And it was a great big, large, you know, 2,000-acre ranch. Well, they could say, you know, we put up fences. We got barbed wire. We have heads of cattle. We've improved it. And the government would probably say, okay, you're right. You can have this. We'll claim, you can claim it as yours. That's the way it would operate for ranching. Now, homesteading was a little different because these people would come out. They would get their quarter of a section. You know, instead of going for 160 acres, they only wanted to go say 40 or 20, something smaller. They would have to basically live on it for up to five years. Uh, one percentage of it is that they would have to plant crops, they would have to turn over the ground, they would have to make an effort to make it look decent. And with these ideas, several towns would grow. Um, Sulphur was a good example, because places came along, they took and developed a uh, general store, a saloon, a church, they had the Assayers office. They had a number of houses in and around the area. Uh, they, interestingly enough, they also had a dance hall because, well, they needed some place to, you know, relax and unwind. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of these smaller towns, they would usually have one building that would serve multiple purposes. Uh, when me and Sue were out on the road a couple weeks ago, we saw what was labeled the uh, Moreau River Community Hall. This was basically a building that served as a church, a school, a public function, which you know would be like for the city council or town council, and a dance hall, all in the same building. And sometimes that's all a community would need. Now, as time would go along, uh, give a good example from what I was reading. Mead County at one time had over 120 rural schools. Now, you got to realize Mead County is about the same size as Rhode Island and Connecticut together. That's a lot of territory. And there was a lot of small settlements that wanted schools for their kids. Sometimes the school might be five or six students, sometimes it might be 20. It all depends on where they were pulling the kids from. Uh, one thing I also learned that was kind of interesting is that one of the places called Stoneville, we've actually been to that school, it was considered a high school at one time. Now, granted, when you think about a high school, uh, you know, I think Central, when I graduated, had a graduating class of about 258 students. Okay, that's a pretty big class. Um, I think my mom told me one time when she was in Denver when she had a graduating class, I think it was just shy of a thousand. Well, <laughs> Stoneville's graduating class, I think, was like uh, 26 kids. But they said, when you think about what st where Stoneville was for the high school, you had two choices, basically. The kids could either go all the way over to Faith which is maybe 80 miles away. They could go 40 miles over to Sturgis. Or they could go down to New Underwood. Or they could possibly go up to Bison in Perkins County. But that's a long ways to take and go to school. 
Especially in the winter. Yeah. And so, you know, back then, a lot of these kids also, you know, when they would take and go to school, they rode horses. I can't imagine riding a horse now to go from Stoneville all the way to Sturgis, can you? No. No. But that's for other reasons other than, you know, distance. <laughs> <laughs> I fell off the horse again. <laughs> but, you know, the, some of the stories I've read, though, that are absolutely crazy. One teacher who was actually uh, teaching at Cooper, a little town that is no more, uh, got caught in a snowstorm in the 40s. And to go from where she was living to the school was 14 miles on horseback, and the drifts were four feet deep. She said, thankfully, she had a horse that was used to that. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, is that there were communities that, you know, when people got together, they, they strove to basically have that community sense. And some of the places, you know, to this day, they still survive, you know. Uh, you think of a place like Union Center. It's not that big, but it has the gas station. It has a machinist shop for farmers. It has, uh, you could call it a general store. It has, uh, you know, a couple small restaurants. And it has people, you know. That's a lot more than some of the other places we've seen. Uh, Stoneville, I think, has a population of three. They no longer have a post office. Their school is closed. And even their uh, their general store is no longer in operation. Then you got places like uh, White Owl. You know, White Owl still has its post office. Still has a general store. I saw, interestingly enough, they have a salon now. Hmm. But, you know, a lot of places, you know, they... It's kind of turned into the the mindset that, you know, people will go where, you know, there's things that they need. Uh, we've seen it a couple times. Rapid City is still continually growing, but places like Wall have kind of gone stagnant because there's not much else to do except go to Wall Drug. Or, you know, if you're in Faith or Lemon, well, you might be able to work on the railroad or go ranching. But there isn't a lot of other options. I mean, both towns have no colleges or universities to keep the students there. Once they graduate from high school, they're probably not going to stick around. Because they don't have anything to offer. They don't expand or grow or change. Right. Now, one last item that uh, does strike me as kind of funny. And uh, several states around the, the Midwest and in the Rocky Mountain areas have been offering free land. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a creative idea for people that want to get out of the cities. You know, the thing is though, you know, how much effort are you willing to put into moving to the smaller towns? You know, I would have to do a whole lot of research to pull up and move to a place with less than a thousand people. I wouldn't do it. I don't think we'd survive probably drive each other crazy trying to find something to do and then watch the Monopoly tournaments turn into a, a throwing of hands and the whole thing. Mm. But, you know, as far as South Dakota goes, you know, there were places that all these folks had was basically a line somebody drew on a map from Bismarck to Deadwood. And then along that route... You know, towns would take and start to grow. Some, you know, like Whitewood. Whitewood is now considered a city. I never realized that until a couple of years ago when I saw it on an election board. The, the enough people in the town said, you know, we want to have an actual city council. And so they made it work. Uh, Sturgis, you know, originally <laughs> Deadwood was a town. Deadwood was a city. And Sturgis didn't even exist. But because Fort Meade was built, they said, well, let's build a town just this far outside of range so we can still get at the government gold that the soldiers have. <laughs> you know, there were plans, and, you know, to this day, um, you know, there are places out there that towns like White Owl, Edding, 
uh, Union Center just opened a new school. And there's also places like, uh, I found out that Chalk Butte used to have a school. And it's now in Union Center. They actually picked up the whole school and moved it uh, 20 miles down the road. Hey, you know, if a, if a town is dying, sometimes they'll say, well, we will let you guys have this and just let our students go to your school. It worked. You know, it kept some towns surviving while others, you know, are now empty fields. But... But as we go, you know, looking at, you know, the, the western South Dakota area, there's a lot of wide open land. Um, not nearly as bad as Harding still is. But, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, they couldn't think of any better place that they'd want to live, you know. <laughs> and our boy is busy making noises, but... But anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. This is Joe from the Mud Files. Be sure to take and check off Box 201 on your college prerequisite form. <laughs> and I'll sign off for your uh, your extra credit of one-half credit hour for your college class. Have a good one, folks. Take care. <laughs>